lost recordings from one of the greats of jazz now found. Jeffrey Brown visited John Coltrane's recording studio where the mystery began. But recently discovered music gives Coltrane, more than 50 years after his death, his highest ever debut on worldwide charts and in sales. A famed recording studio, one of the greatest jazz ensembles ever, a beautiful blast back to music made on a single day in March 1963. Here at the Van Gelder Studio in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, a group of critics, family members, and music executives gathered recently to hear a lost recording by saxophonist John Coltrane and other members of his classic quartet, pianist McCoy Tyner, bassist Jimmy Garrison, and drummer Elvin Jones. Among them, Ravi Coltrane, John's son, and himself a highly regarded sax player. It's like discovering a buried treasure. I hear him basically one foot in the past and one foot sort of aiming toward his future. Thus the title of a new release of seven tunes which Ravi helped produce, both directions at once, the lost album. The record contains a lot of material that you could easily hear in, in recordings that he could have made five years earlier, you know, blueses and, 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 and bebop tunes, uh, combined with, with more modal pieces and things, that, more experimental pieces uh, that he would eventually get to later in 64 and 65. It's a timeless group. We're still talking about these players and we're still talking about this band decades later. John Coltrane was a titan, one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century, in jazz or any other genre. He first made his name in the mid-1950s. Growing more and more assured, innovating constantly, trying new sounds, he reached jazz lovers with recordings such as his 1960 album, Giant Steps. And a wider audience with hits like his version of My Favorite Things, released a year later. He has complete mastery of the repertoire of jazz up to that point, and he's taking that repertoire and the style into a whole other realm. We're still seeing the relevance of this music now. Ken Drucker is an executive with Verb Records, which is releasing the music on the Impulse label, so closely associated with Coltrane. He says the saxophonist was at the peak of his powers during these sessions. Do you have a favorite uh, song on this new old recording? I love the track that opens, the uh, romantically titled Original 11383, <laughs> um, just because the energy immediately from the first note There are tracks on this album that are uh, more straight ahead. There's a long blues. But then there are original compositions that are a little more searching. Just how this music was lost in the first place is something of a mystery. Coltrane was recording a lot at the time. You fill my eager heart. He and the band were back here the very next day to make an album with singer Johnny Hartman that would become a classic. They were also at the end of a two-week run at the famed Birdland Club in Manhattan. The March 6 session, capturing some of that live feel in the studio, was recorded on both a master and reference tape the latter for Coltrane to take home. The master was lost. Coltrane's personal tape turned up years later with the family of his first wife, Naima. Ken Drucker and others heard the music for the first time last December. You had heard the recording outside the studio, and then you came here and listened to it, and what happened? <laughs> came in here, walked in this area right here where the band would have been set up, mm -hmm. and the music was played through the speakers in the studio, and I just stopped in my tracks. It was literally spine tingling. It was as if the band was here playing. 
The here is also an important part of jazz history. The Van Gelder studio is hallowed ground, where the likes of Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Herbie Hancock, and many others recorded albums. Rudy Van Gelder, who died in 2016, actually began recording jazz in his parents' house in Hackensack. He made a living as an optometrist first, before turning to recording full-time when he built this gorgeous studio, designed by David Henkin, a protege of Frank Lloyd Wright in 1959. Attracted by the Van Gelder's sound, the jazz greats kept crossing the Hudson. The studio even served as a setting for famous album covers. The staircase, vent, the deck railing outside. March 6th, March 1963. Six. So the Coltrane session, two to four. One to Maureen four. Sickler worked for 30 years as Van Gelder's assistant sound engineer. She showed me the appointment book he kept to track his busy recording schedule, including that day in 1963. Did he say where his love of jazz came from? What he liked most about it was the improvisatory part. They were creating it on the fly. He heard records when he was a kid yeah. and, and teenager yeah. made by the big companies, and he said, I can do better than that. It should sound better. All these years later, only pianist McCoy Tyner of the original group is still alive. And still performing that very night at Manhattan's Blue Note Club, where he recalled the magic of those days. It was unbelievable. I can't even describe how it was. He used to practice a lot. You know, he did his work. It made him stronger. Yeah, I learned a lot from working with John. John Coltrane went on to make his groundbreaking album, A Love Supreme, in 1965 and from there ventured further into an ever freer realm of jazz that opened up new possibilities for music. He died in 1967 of liver cancer at just 40 years old. But his influence continues to be felt, including on his son Ravi, who was not quite two when his father died. It's kind of mind-blowing to think about how much work he was able to create in 10 years. It's hard to know why John Coltrane's music hits us deeply and touches us deeply. You know, it's hard to always recognize why the music is uh, as effective and as powerful as it is, but, but somehow it, it, it translates. His message translates, and mm -hmm. again, the power of his conviction really it comes through. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown at the Van Gelder Studio in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey.